Today's question was brought by Tammy, who said, I'm wondering if you might have any organization tips for someone who does a crap load of activities. And she goes on to share that she's a music teacher, a songwriter, animal rescuer, crochet, knitter, crafter, photographer, and so on. Tammy, thank you so much for bringing up this question because I know it's a concern that a lot of people have. I myself am a creative person. And so I understand that there can be a battle between your passions and your space. I actually initially went to college with an art scholarship for painting. I've done everything from singing to writing, videography, photography, graphics design for my business. And this year I even got into crochet. All of this to say, I totally understand what it's like to be multi-passionate and creative and try to balance that with your space. And unfortunately there is this huge misconception that one cannot be minimalist and multi-creative. So I'm here as a minimalist and a multi-creative passionate person to tell you that that is absolutely not true. You can be both. Now I'm going to share with you some general guidelines that'll kind of help you to make these decisions and create these systems inside of your own space when it comes to your creative passions and your artistic supplies, whatever those supplies may be. I'll show you what I've done with some of my own supplies that I do have inside of my home. But first, I think that there's just a, a mindset shift that has to happen for all of us creative people to kind of bridge the gap. Because if you feel like creatives aren't meant to be clutter free or like it's a block to your creative process, it's going to be really difficult for you to maintain a clutter free space and become whatever version of clutter free or minimalist that you're trying to work toward. I find that I'm more artistically inspired when my art supplies are orderly. So if I were to be presented with a big box just filled with different types of acrylics and oil paints and paint brushes and charcoals and all of that, there's nothing inspiring about that to me. It does not call to me to create something as opposed to having my supplies um, minimized so that I'm able to actually see the things that I want to use the most frequently because we all know we're not using all of the stuff all of the time. That whole 80-20 rule, you probably use 80% of your belongings 20% of the time when you're doing these crafts. So keeping that in mind, the things that you actually use will get more use and be more inspiring to be used if you don't have quite so much and if the stuff that you do have is somehow organized. <laughs> I get inspired to mess around with my photography equipment when I see that it's easily accessible and it's laid out in a neat orderly way that inspires me to mess around with it. I start getting ideas as creative juices start flowing. So if you start looking at minimizing as being a part of your creative process, I think that you'll find the transition from chaotic mess with all of your supplies to organized and inspired. I think you'll find that transition to be a lot smoother and with a lot less personal resistance. Think more creativity with less stuff. I'm going to go ahead and dive into these guidelines. Go ahead and give this a thumbs up. If you are a passionate creative who's ready to finally minimize and get in order all of your passionate creative supplies. If you're interested in more information or tips or ideas for holistic clutter free spaces, that is what my channel Mia Danielle here is all about. Please feel free to go ahead and click subscribe and turn on notifications because I release new videos every Tuesday. So here are some guidelines that I operate by and I definitely recommend that you give these things a whirl, okay? My first guideline tip is to stay project focused. We tend to have these far reaching ideas or we get inspired and excited about the supplies themselves without actually attaching the concept of the supply to an actual project. And what this ends up being is numerous, numerous supplies that maybe have never been used in a project or that have no project upcoming in mind. So when you stay project focused and you really narrow down and hone in on whatever the current project is that you're working on, you're able to not only get the best supplies for that particular project, but you don't end up with all of the excess. I exercised this recently when I was creating blankets for my daughters for Christmas. I created like three crocheted blankets and a crocheted outfit for my dog. It was a really hectic, busy crochet month. There were so many different yarns and colors to look at. My creative wheels just started like firing, right? I was thinking, oh, you know what, this, this nice hygge material that's really soft and furry, maybe I can use this when I'm done with the blankets for something else. You know how it goes. I just, I wanted to try all of the different things, but I forced myself to only shop for one project at a time. I didn't even shop for all of the projects that I knew I was planning on doing. I just shopped for the one project at a time. So first I made 
Charlie's little dog outfit, right? And I only bought the yarn for that dog outfit, completed that project, and then moved on to a different project. So when you stay project focused like that, you're able to actually be more excited because every time you finish a project, then you get to go shop for your new project supplies, especially when it's something like crocheting where you are needing to buy new yarn for future projects. So stay focused on the projects, make sure that before you go buy a bunch of supplies, that you actually have an idea of what you're gonna do with them. Guideline number two, is to make sure that you have some kind of space limitations for your creative passions. This may be separated space limitations for different types of passions. For example, I use a part of my storage area in the garage for my lighting equipment for these videos. I use a shopping bag for my spatial limitation when it comes to any yarns that I'm using for crochet projects. So first, I only have the stuff for a project, one project at a time when it comes to the crochet. So I'm working through that yarn one at a time so it's not piling up. But then I'm also giving myself the limitation of only purchasing things that fill up this one bag. That way it's not getting out of control because there's no way that I'm effectively going to be able to use hundreds and hundreds of skeins of yarn. It's just not happening. There is no project that requires that much yarn. So why would I need to hold on to that just so that it can take up space in my closet? That's where focusing on one project at a time comes in. And that's where having limitations for how much you're allowing at a time helps to support that. So here's how this could work in different types of mediums. If you are a songwriter or you're a pianist, anybody who collects or writes different types of music, give yourself the limitation of a binder or a set of binders and maybe even a section on a shelf that solely belongs to and is there to hold all of your musical papers. And then you might even go beyond that and start uploading the papers that you're no longer using to digitize them online. That is 100% what I would do, especially when it comes to written music. That's a great idea to digitize them because you can always print it out and you have those notes and that information and those words still saved somewhere that's not taking up space. For painting supplies, that could be a bin or a box. That's exactly what we use here. I have a set of acrylic paints and a set of oil paints and a set of mini canvas boards that we got recently to do projects with my daughters. And all of those stay in one bin, they're all together. So they have this box limitation. Also, I'm not buying more acrylic paints until I run out of the acrylic paints that I currently have. I'm not running off and trying to find various colors for future projects that I may or may not wanna do. I've got the equipment that I need and unless I specifically need something else, like I specifically need a color that I for some reason don't have, which I usually don't, I'm only keeping the things that I have until they're used and then replacing them with new things. For my camera equipment, I have the original camera that I bought years ago, like probably a decade ago. It's a Canon T3i, that's what I'm using right now. I pulled it back out when I started making these YouTube videos and it still works fine. I've purchase new lenses for it, but I've also created space by getting rid of lenses that I wasn't using. So I currently have the stock lens that came with it, the zoom lens that bought at the time I bought the camera, and this new Sigma lens that I'm using right now to video all of my YouTube videos and sometimes for photography. So the Sigma lens generally stays on the camera and the camera generally stays on the tripod so that I can pull it out and use it whenever. The other two lenses fit inside the camera bag and that's it. Now, since we're talking about spatial limitations and where we're gonna locate things, I do wanna add that there are some things that look nice on display or that you can incorporate as part of your decor and kind of show a little bit of your interests and personality. So I do keep my guitar as part of the decor in the corner of my studio here. And then I also keep my podcast microphone on its boom stand on a little table down here in the studio mostly because I like the way that it looks. I like the convenience of having it there on a table and sliding it out when I need it. If I didn't like the way that it looked, then I would easily fold it away and put it in my music bin that I have right here on the bookshelf. Guideline number three is to have a plan or a system for the leftovers. Most creative projects are gonna have some kind of leftovers. There's gonna be the leftover paints that you didn't use or the leftover yarn that you didn't need to complete your project. Some of the things that you can hold on to, and so your plan might be to keep them in the bin until they're completely empty. For example, with the paints, you might wanna hold on to the paints until 
the tube is completely empty. You might want to hold on to the yarn as long as it's not becoming too much, but you might also just think of a different backup plan. So maybe you have a friend that you donate your leftover yarn to. Maybe you have a donation center that you donate your leftover supplies to. Or maybe you use all of the rest of your supplies to create something like toboggans for the homeless. Whatever your system, whatever your plan, it's better to have some kind of plan for the moment that you know is going to be here in the future. Have an idea of what you expect yourself to do. And then when the moment comes, you're not confused and just shoving things places because you already know what you're going to do with the stuff. Guideline number four is to be honest about what type of creative you are. I understand I am such a creative person that sometimes I'll see other types of creative tasks and I'll think, oh, that looks great. I would love to try it and I'll never get to it. Sometimes it's not that I just don't think that the thing is interesting, but I don't think that it's as interesting as something else. So be honest with yourself. Is this the thing that you're never going to get to? Because in reality, you would rather spend your free time or your creative time doing something else. So be honest with those things. A lot of times we, we even have these concepts of who we think we are, who we would like to be, the type of person we'd like to be. And we'll purchase things based off of this visualization of who we would like to be. And it doesn't always match up with who we actually are and what we actually like to do with our time. So work on that self-awareness. Is it something that in the past you've actually reached for or enjoyed doing? Or is it just something that sounds nice, but maybe isn't your cup of tea? And guideline number five is to make space for your creative passions. A lot of times it's not that we need to cut down on the tennis balls and tennis rackets if you're into that or you know, the, the yarn and the crochet, it's not always necessarily that we need to cut down on the products that go along with our passions, but that we just have so much clutter in general that it makes that feel like so much more. So maybe it's that you need to create more space for those products. Maybe there are other things that you should be decluttering. Maybe if you decluttered your living room shelves of all of the books and the little decor items and any excess that you have in there, you would actually find that you have quite a bit of space to put a bin for the crafts that you're trying to save up for. Or maybe if you decluttered your closet of all of the excess clothes that you're not even wearing that are crammed into different drawers and taken up all of the nooks and crannies of your closet, you might actually have a space to put your camera equipment or your art equipment. So make space for your passions and then see if maybe you don't need to declutter quite as many of them as you thought you did. Remember, at the end of the day, it's not all about owning the bare minimum number of things. It's about creating holistic, supportive spaces that make you happy and that make you feel good. If you need some help getting started on that whole process, then I recommend that you take my free masterclass my holistic clutter-free formula. I'll leave the link to that down in the description. And if you're looking to find more time to get some of these decluttering projects done, then check out this video on how to find the time to declutter. I'll catch you next week.